broken blues Climb the fence, books and pens I can tell that we are gonna be friends It's a pleasure and an honor for me to have the chance to welcome you all here today uh, for the first day of our conference, uh, the Berlin Freedom of Expression Forum. Censorship and freedom in traditional and new media. The revolution of media as a tool of freedom and expression. Uh, my name is Mark Donfried, the director and founder of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. And uh, in many ways, this is a very important conference, also in terms of the field of cultural diplomacy. Uh, now, some of you may be familiar with the term of cultural diplomacy. Uh, and for a long time, it was actually very much associated with the issue of also freedom of expression. Uh, let's give, a, for example, the case of the Cold War. Uh, during the Cold War period, really cultural diplomacy was about winning the hearts and minds of foreign audiences uh, at a time where there were various, uh, let's say, or different variations of freedom of expression in the different parts of the world, uh, let's say this bipolar world, uh, where cultural diplomacy was taking place. But cultural diplomacy was very much about sort of giving a message about expression expressing a certain image of a country. Uh, you know, the United States is like this, or the Soviet Union is like that. Uh, and in that sense, even there was on the front of the America House here in Berlin a plaque, uh, which said to tell America's story to the world. Uh, so very much that was thought of as really the main mission uh, of cultural diplomacy, really to project a certain image of a country, to win the hearts and minds, to attract others to, to like your country. At the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy, we look at those models of cultural diplomacy we term as, as sort of, I guess, what I would say old school cultural diplomacy or classical cultural diplomacy. Uh, at the Institute, we feel today we really live in an interdependent world. Uh, and actually, the need for cultural diplomacy is much greater than just persuasion, uh, just by saying you should like our country because of this or our country is like that. We feel that new school cultural diplomacy is much more actually about facilitating access uh, between cultures to enable citizens as well as different, uh, let's say, cultural uh, yeah, members of different cultural groups really to get to know each other uh, on, by their own. Uh, for example, academic exchange. So I would say new school cultural diplomacy is really how do we help educate, enhance, and sustain relationships uh, to enable a better understanding and ideally trust between citizens and also between nations. So that's really when we talk about the, the freedom of expression forum uh, and really freedom of expression in the world today, uh, we see it as very intimately linked also with cultural diplomacy. And really if the job of cultural diplomacy is to make it easier for cultures to come into contact and citizens to actually have understanding and trust, of course freedom of expression is key. Uh, in the sense cultural diplomacy should be about opening it up, uh, making it easier uh, for the travels to take place, making it easier for the exchanges, making it easier for the dialogue. So when you have situations in the world where there's less freedom of expression uh, than in other places, that makes it difficult for cultural diplomacy. Uh, there, a big example that we won't deal with so much in the conference, but I think is quite relevant, uh, is actually China. Uh, as you may know, the fastest growing cultural diplomacy institution in the world today is actually the Confucius Institute. Uh, they have, I think, about 380 Confucius Institutes now already built. They want to build 1,000 in the next five years. Uh, so really, China is, is taking charge of culture. Uh, and for, for China, culture matters. And they're saying this is an important way for us to really promote promote uh, our agenda, so to speak. Uh, we have to obviously pose the question, is the Confucius Institute culture diplomacy? or is it propaganda? Uh, you may also know there are many scandals actually associated with the Confucius Institute where the Chinese don't always want to welcome, let's say, European cultural institutes in China, uh, but they do want to build their own abroad. Uh, so again, it's a loaded case. I think there one could classify that as culture diplomacy, but again, very much linked with this issue of freedom of expression, censorship, etc. And there are really some, some fascinating examples. So the goal of the next four days is really to pose questions, uh, not necessarily new questions, but we're hoping that we'll have some new answers. Uh, you may have seen we have a very interdisciplinary group of speakers, a very international group of speakers, some coming from the field of media, some not. Uh, some really fighting for, for freedom of expression, as with uh, Mr. Ribal al-Assad later today, uh, really at risk of their own lives. Uh, so I think really it should be a fascinating chance this week uh, to really see from the, the eyes, let's say, of the practitioners, the people who are actually there fighting for freedom of expression, as well as those from the media uh, who are actually dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis. So I really look forward uh, to learning uh, the next four days uh, with you uh, and also with the speakers. Uh, I would make the notes and the request of everyone here, please don't be shy uh, in the sense, pose your questions, uh, disagree. Uh, let's try to make this as interactive as we can. Uh, so I've asked the speakers to keep their presentations relatively short, uh, ideally around 20 minutes, to enable uh, as much discussion as possible. Uh, so I'm expecting very active uh, participation from the audience. And I think really through that interaction, we can really benefit and learn a lot from each other. So that would be my, my one request uh, to all of the participants, as well as the other speakers. Uh, so in that sense, it's really engage uh, in a multilateral discussion as much as possible. 
Uh, I'd like to actually, before we introduce the first keynote speaker of the morning, <laughs> introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Peter Graven, uh, who's actually a very well-known moderator. You may have seen him on TV uh, for Deutsche Welle. Uh, and in his free time, which is not so much, he also serves as a member of the advisory board of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy and has been really quite helpful in terms of his support, his advice, also his participation throughout the years at the Institute. He's kindly agreed to assist with the main moderation of the day. Uh, so he'll actually be introducing the speakers as well as helping us with the panel discussions. So I'm really grateful for you taking the time uh, today and then also on the final day of the conference to assist in this way. And I'd ask you to please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Peter Graven. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, now you know who I am, so I don't need to introduce myself. I am Peter Graven from Deutsche Welle TV, where I have a talk show, where I do some presenting, where I uh, report from the Bundestag trying to explain German politics to uh, the rest of the world. Uh, but that's enough about me. We're going to now go straight on to our first guest, uh, or our first speaker today, Clive Myrie, yeah? <laughs> uh, who's been in journalism. He's with the BBC. A lot of people will know him. He's a very familiar face. He's been in journalism uh, for over 20 years. Yeah, he's been a reporter uh, in many continents around the world. I think at least three continents, Asia, Europe, North America. Five, okay, <laughs> five continents he's claiming, yeah? And now Clive is gonna come up here. He's going to join me and he's going to speak about rights and freedom in the age of new media, conflicts of freedom of expression in the modern world. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Should I come here? Thank you very much indeed. I'm gonna start by asking a question to all of you. How many of you have broken the law here? Oh, blah, blah. <laughs> lots of hands have gone up there. Now I was gonna say, obviously not murdering someone or I don't know, attacking someone. Uh, and if, you, that if, if that is what you've done, I don't want to know. You can keep that to yourselves. Um, but yes, I saw lots of hands go up there. So I'm, I'm, I'm expecting, I suppose, minor infringement. Dropping litter, perhaps rubbish when you shouldn't do. Parking in a no-parking zone, that kind of thing. Um, taking your dog into a park when the sign says, don't take dogs in. Is that the kind of thing you've done? No? What have you done then? Download. Download, all right, downloading when you shouldn't have downloaded. Okay, okay. I suspect that probably affects a lot of you. Well, how would you feel if someone actually filmed you doing that? Breaking the law. Downloading. And then that film was posted all over the world. Whatever it was you did. Parking illegally or downloading illegally or whatever. How would you feel if someone recorded you doing that and it was put on the internet and sent everywhere? No. The whole world knowing your shame, right? Well, recently a woman in the city of Bath. Now, Bath is a city in the west of England which has very narrow streets for traffic. Okay? She stopped her car in the middle of the highway in rush hour. Right? She just stopped it in the middle of rush hour. Now, she was trying to make a left-hand turn down a road that was closed. She was angry about this, got out of her car, left the car there, and started remonstrating with the guy who was on the barrier, stopping cars making that left-hand turn. Now, while she, of course, left her car in the middle of the road, traffic backed up. It went on and on and on for possibly a quarter of a mile. And, of course, a man saw what was happening, and he started filming it on his mobile phone. The woman sees the man and she starts shouting at him, you can't film someone without their permission, she says. She's following down the street, she's agitated. Several times she tries to snatch the phone from him. She then tells the man she'll call the police if he doesn't hand over the phone and tell the police that he tried to attack her, that he tried to assault her. She's made all this up. She just wants her hand on that phone because she doesn't want her private shame made public around the world. Now, of course, the man didn't try to attack her. These are all lies. She started calling him names. You're a nasty little man, an ugly, fat, nosy, busybody who had no business filming her. The man with the phone kept calm and he said he filmed her because he thought it was wrong that someone could hold up all the traffic in the way that she did. And then he told her something that shook her to the core. The video would look great on YouTube. Now at this point, she really went completely white. And her husband tried to get hold of the camera, but failed. I mean, who wouldn't 
be worried. She'd done nothing wrong. And soon the whole world would know that she had in fact done something wrong. For a split second, she knew how President Assad of Syria might actually feel. China, the Chinese Communist Party, Muammar Gaddafi. Though, of course, their crimes are monumental compared to hers. Now, of course, guess what? The video was posted on YouTube in January. Since then, almost 40,000 people have seen it. It's gone viral. The woman involved now says she regularly gets abusive phone calls and emails from members of the public who've seen it and hate her. Police are now investigating some of these abusive phone calls. The woman owns a clothes shop in Bath, and some people have left messages on YouTube saying customers should boycott her shop and leave bad reviews of her store on the internet. The woman now says her life is a misery, and she's lost many, many customers. So we have a man who saw a crime being committed, admittedly a minor crime, the woman parking her car illegally in the busy street, inconveniencing scores of people. He decided to film her, and she responded by attacking him verbally. So he issued the ultimate battle cry of the new media age. The video would look great on YouTube. It will be awesome. Those are his exact words. And the unintended consequence of that is that her business, her livelihood, is now very badly affected. The question is, did she deserve this? What do you think? Did she deserve that? No. She was horrible to the man with the phone. She was horrible to all those drivers she couldn't get past, who couldn't get past her car left in the middle of the highway. She did come across as a nasty woman. But does she deserve abusive phone calls, her business potentially ruined? The man with the mobile phone was exercising his right to film in a public street, and he had every right to put the video on YouTube. But what about the woman's rights? Did she not have any? A right to privacy, perhaps, to not have this episode in her life spread across the globe on the internet. Was she in no position to say, don't film me, don't shame me in the eyes of the world? Just consider this. The Geneva Convention say prisoners of war should not be filmed because they might be ridiculed and made fun of in public. And that's precisely what I did in Iraq. And my editors say that can't go out because I filmed prisoners. So do prisoners of war really have more rights than you and me in the digital age? The 18th century philosopher William Godwin wrote that the real or supposed rights of man are of two kinds, active and passive. The right in certain cases to do as we please, and the right we possess to the forbearance or assistance of other men. In other words, you might have the right to eat smelly food on the train next to me, but I would hope you would understand that I might not want to smell your food. So to be polite, you wouldn't eat the food next to me. If you were alive today, Godwin would say, yes, the man with the mobile phone had his rights, but the woman also had rights, which the internet age just doesn't seem or cannot seem to acknowledge. So it seems perhaps the internet and new media, the supposed tool of liberation, of expression and freedom, may in fact have trapped us, in a way, actually taking away some of our liberties and rights. Now you might say, well actually, hang on a minute, that's a bit over the top, isn't it? Well, consider this, and you'll know this story well, David. A famous married footballer in England has an affair with another woman. He goes to court to prevent the story being published in the newspapers. Now, he's obviously ashamed and embarrassed and believes this is not a story that the public needs to know about. It's not in the public interest. This is between him and his wife and nobody else. The footballer says, my life will be made a living hell by the football fans at matches who will boo and jeer me on the pitch. I won't be able to do my job, and this will affect me materially. A judge in court agrees, because there might also be, though this was never tested, the possibility of the woman the footballer is having the affair with blackmailing him, saying, I will sell my story to the papers if you do not give me thousands of pounds. So here we have... Godwin's collision of rights, the active and the passive. 
The active rights are those of the newspapers who want to publish the story and feel in a free society they should be able to, and the passive rights of the footballer who believes he has a right to privacy and what he does in his bedroom is his business and if he's cheating on his wife, then it's his wife who has the right to be angry, not the whole of the rest of society. So the judge in this case, and this is a true story, granted an injunction banning newspapers from reporting anything about the story so that the footballer, his wife, and his mistress could not be identified. Now guess what happened? Someone somewhere knew the name of the footballer and tweeted his name. It was then retweeted and retweeted and retweeted to the point where the footballer's name was known across the country, across the world. This was in direct contravention of the judge's order that the footballer's name should not be released to the public because the footballer, even though he'd been unfaithful, still had rights. But what was the judge to do now? He couldn't round up all those Twitterers, thousands of them, potentially millions of them around the country, and throw them all in jail. The footballer actually tried to take Twitter to court. He did. But the company is based in America and therefore not subject to English law. The judge in the case eventually said because Twitter was not a medium used by the majority of people in the fact that the percentage of people who use it is very small compared to the size of the population, then it wasn't quite as devastating to have the footballer's name tweeted as it might have been if a national newspaper published the name. So the judge left it at that. He didn't do anything. Well, now guess what happened? A newspaper in Scotland, which is not bound by English law, said this was outrageous, that Twitter and new media in general should not be bound by the same laws as their traditional media, like newspapers, radio, and television. The suggestion that Twitter had more freedom to do things and publish whatever it wanted to was unfair. So the Scottish paper decided to put on its front page a big picture of the footballer revealing its, his identity to highlight what it felt was unfair practice. In the end, the footballer saw no point in continuing his legal challenges. So many people knew who he was, that he cheated on his wife. He gave up the ban and it was lifted and newspapers and broadcast stations today can now reveal his name. In the middle of all this, of course, was the footballer's wife, who now saw her life splashed across newspapers. She was embarrassed and ashamed, just like the woman in Bath. And their children, because of all this, were teased and laughed at at school and bullied at school. This is all true. And of course, there was the footballer who, for months after the story broke, was jeered and booed every time he touched the ball in a match by tens of thousands of football fans which is probably fair enough, he did cheat on his wife. His private shame, however, was now very, very public. So what about the private shame of President Bashar al-Assad of Syria or Hosni Mubarak of Egypt or the Chinese Communist Party? Rulers who don't or didn't, in the case of Mubarak, allow a free press and international journalists to go where they want to, when they want to. New media like Twitter and Facebook have helped make the private shame of these regimes, the repression and subjugation of their people, very public for all the world to see. The 18th century political theorist, author and parliamentarian Edmund Burke referred to a free press as the fourth estate, saying that the press was vital to the smooth running of a free and fair society. In places like Syria, Twitter and Facebook are vehicles for ordinary people to shine a light on their lives in the absence of a free press. Ordinary citizens are the fourth estate and as such vital. But in a free society, what is social media, Facebook and Twitter for? Simply to stay in touch with friends or to peddle gossip about footballers and women who park their cars illegally in the middle of the road? Pope Benedict and the Vatican certainly think there's more to it all. Last Friday, it was announced that the leader of a billion Catholics worldwide is going to take to Twitter. No data has been set for the momentous first tweet, and we don't know what the account name will be, 
but one newspaper is suggesting it will be called at Benedictus PP16. Last month, in advance of the Church's World Communications Day, the Pope said search engines and social networks have become the starting point of communication for many people who are seeking advice, ideas, information, and answers. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately, this constant flow of questions demonstrates the restlessness of human beings ceaselessly searching for truths of greater or lesser import that can offer meaning and hope to their lives. Now, that's a very elegant way, basically, of saying, yes, the Internet can provide the location of the best Chinese takeaway in your area. Or maybe even tittle-tattle about a footballer's private life. But it can also help us understand who we are. To this end, the Vatican has already given its blessing to an iPhone app that's let, that lets Catholics keep track of their sins. It's true. It's true. It's precisely because social media can offer so much, not just trivialization, that there is a huge debate going on in Britain at the moment about whether content on the internet should be regulated in the same way newspapers and the traditional media are governed. People like Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook and Julian Assange of the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks would argue that freedom on the internet is paramount, that restrictions should be few. But as more and more people get information from social media and the internet, Relegating the usefulness of newspapers, whose sales across the developed world are falling sharply, it can be strongly argued, perhaps, that with that increased power comes increased responsibility. How can it be that in the interest of openness and free expression, people's lives are put at risk? Diplomats, governments, human rights activists, organizations representing journalists, they all urged Julian Assange last year not to release more than a thousand uncensored US diplomatic cables because they contain references to people persecuted by their governments, victims of sex offenses, or whistleblowers. Reporters Without Borders, a press freedom group, no less. They're all for openness, objected, saying some cables showed the names of informants in various countries, including Israel, Jordan, Iran, and Afghanistan. One Ethiopian journalist has had to flee his country after being interrogated by the security forces when his name appeared in one of the cables. In response, the organization, the Committee to Protect Journalists, said WikiLeaks must take responsibility for its actions. This is again another classic example of Godwin's clash of rights in action. The freedom of expression WikiLeaks feels it's, is its right to publish and be damned. And frankly, the Ethiopian journalist's basic human right to life. So where does all this leave us in a world where a lie, a half-truth, or a dangerous truth can travel around the world in a split second? One writer on the new media, Clay, Clay Shirky, believes the internet has resulted in the largest increase in expressive capability in the history of the human race. Yes, more and more of us can freely express our hopes, desires, wishes. The big question might just be, at what cost? Thank you. The, the question that it prompts, and I think it's going to be the question for the next couple of days, the, sort of the, the, the big question, and I'd like to just uh, pose it straight off to you, Clive, is mm. do you, given what you're saying, do you think that there needs to be uh, there clearly is an awful lot of thought going on about this, but does the whole notion of what journalism is and what a journalist is need to be redefined? And in which direction could that debate go? Uh, oh, actually, I can use this one. Um, it does have to be analyzed, looked into, and debated. And that debate is taking place in the UK at the moment. Um, there is a very huge public inquiry called the Levison Inquiry, um, which is looking at um, ethics within the media, but, well, actually, particularly newspapers, um, and their relationship in society with the police. And it's throwing up all kinds of questions as to whether there needs to be uh, regulation, more regulation, not just of the newspaper industry, but actually of new media as well. Facebook, Twitter, the internet. I think it's interesting to remember that 
when the internet was developing and new media was taking off, late 70s into the 80s and 90s, this was, this was at a time when the word government was actually becoming a dirty word. I mean, in, in Ronald Reagan's uh, uh, famous phrase, uh, government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem. And we saw, as the internet was developing, that sort of relegation of what many people feel government can offer. It was seen as being intrusive, getting in the way. Too much regulation was stifling creativity. It was stifling economic progress. And we saw um, the role of government fall by the wayside uh, in comparison to how government existed before. So people like Bill Clinton, um, Tony Blair, really became managers of societies. They weren't really um, running uh, governments that influenced our lives in the way that they used to. And this was the period when the internet was developing. Um, and that was happening right across a lot of Western democracies. Um, you saw more liberalize, liberalization of industries. You saw utilities sold off, privatization. Government was getting less of a role in life. Um, and that's when the internet was developing. So a lot of young people um, who are in their 20s, 30s, during this time, uh, really have less of a sense that there is a role for government to play in regulating certain things. Um, and I think that sense of freedom pervades in the work of Mr. Zuckerberg and um, Google, Facebook, and Mr. Assange. That my question now is, because the internet, citizen journalism, uh, social media, because that has taken off so much, and it is beginning to overtake the power of newspapers and the traditional media, is there a role now to be played? Is there a regulatory role that needs to be played? And that's simply the question that I'm posing, and it's, the, uh, as I say, a part of a huge debate that's taking place in the UK at the moment. Just, just one more question from my part, because what you're talking about is you, you're talking about after the comment you made from Ronald Reagan and, you do, and, and a move away from the centralized, uh, the monolithic role, if you want, of government, we suddenly had decentralized multi, multiplicity. And we're all getting very, very excited about that. Mm. But when you describe it, you, 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 talk about, you talk about Facebook, you talk about Twitter, you talk about Google. These two are incredibly monolithic institutions. In and of themselves, that's true. That's absolutely right. Um, but their effects, although they're, they're centrally controlled, um, the access that people have to them is huge. I mean, we know that. And we know that Facebook is reaching, what, close to a billion um, people. I think it'll be hitting that mark quite, quite soon. Um, that's a billion people who can interact between themselves um, and as more societies get online, and we're seeing uh, that increase very much so in, in, in parts of Africa, um, although they're centrally controlled, their effects are very wide. And it's that sort of multiplicity of usage that needs to be possibly looked at. Okay, I've seen lots of other people scribbling uh, notes while uh, Clive has been speaking. Uh, I don't want to hog the questions. Would somebody else like to have a go? The, um, uh, you were discussing in the first example uh, this lady receiving sort of additional communal sanctions because of what she was perceived to have done wrong. Is the problem, therefore, one of internet anonymity, that she can receive additional sanctions because we know who she is, but the person who has also done something wrong in publicizing this cannot receive additional sanctions because, she, because we don't know who he or they are? Sure, absolutely. I mean, that, that is, that, that is part, of, part of the issue. I mean, you know, there's, there's this thing called trolling. Uh, you know, you basically go online, you say whatever you like about anybody, anywhere, a lot of the time breaking the law, and because there is a level of anonymity there, a lot of the time you can get away with it. Now, if what you're saying is particularly criminal, 
and does break certain laws, then it would be up to someone to make a complaint, make this available to the uh, local authorities, and the police can in get involved, certainly in the United Kingdom. I don't know about the rest of the world. But there are sanctions if someone makes a report and that name can be traced to a uh, UP address or, or what, whatever it is. Um, but that takes time, it takes money, it takes effort. And a lot of the time, it's just not worth it. You know, whatever's said is out there, it's around the world anyway, it's just too late to intervene. So that is a big part of the problem. Now what the footballer, in the example that I gave you, tried to do, he tried to track down the first tweet. He can't go after the, I don't know, 20,000 people who tweet, retweeted it. But he tried to go after the first tweet. Now that meant him having to go to Palo Alto in California, to Twitter, for them to track down the IP address of the person who sent the first tweet. Again, because the law that regu was regulating his case was, came out of the United Kingdom, America was not subject to that, therefore they didn't have to do it. The question is, perhaps they should have done. I don't know. Perhaps they should have had some kind of internal structure that says, okay, in this kind of instance, maybe this is what we should do. The knee-jerk reaction was, well, it's nothing to do with us, and we prefer freedom in the internet anyway, so forget about it. What I'm saying is perhaps Facebook or Twitter or whatever should have some kind of internal regulation that looks into this kind of thing. Uh, I'm not suggesting, even though I talked about a lack of government regulation, I'm not suggesting there should be government regulation. And the uh, debate that's taking place in the UK at the Levison inquiry, I don't think the judge is going to fall um, it is going to recommend government regulation. I think what he will do is try to put forward some kind of idea for a more robust um, regulation within the industry itself and proper sanctions within the industry itself. And perhaps that's where Twitter, Facebook, and so on, um, maybe that's the kind of avenue that they could move, could move into. Uh, 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 Jerry Edling, uh, th this is somewhat of a related question, but uh, you uh, you highlighted right here. Uh, you highlighted uh, one of the problems of uh, of dealing with this kind of thing when you mentioned that uh, you know, Twitter is based in the United States, and uh, basically in the uh, in the new media age, your server can be almost anywhere in the world, including outside uh, national jurisdictions altogether. You could theoretically have a uh, server in the middle of the ocean. Mm. So uh, how do you deal with the uh, sort of establishing, or should there be uh, conventions established? Uh, and do you think international organizations should, uh, should get involved at all? And, uh, and what about the uh, specific uh, uh, companies uh, involved? Uh, just uh, the whole idea of uh, you know, dealing with it internationally. Sure. I mean, it's, it's, as you say, the server could be, could be on the moon. It could be absolutely anywhere. I mean, how, you know, it, it's, it's a technology that, that, uh, that crosses borders at lightning speed. How do you control it? How, how do you deal with, with that? Um, piracy in the Indian Ocean. Um, it's huge, the Indian Ocean. <laughs> it's pretty massive. Um, uh, how do you deal with Somali piracy there. A number of nations have come together and they patrol certain areas of the water. There is an agreement, there's an international agreement as to what to do. Organized crime, um, whether it be uh, the smuggling of, of migrants, uh, prostitution crossing borders, um, drugs, you know, international agencies have come together to try and deal with that kind of thing. Now, I'm not equating um, some of the sins, if there are any, um, of the internet with that kind of thing. But there is a sense, I don't think there is, I don't think there's been enough of a debate about how we balance those active rights and those passive rights, and whether there is a role for the international community to get involved. I think the debate has been one direction. The internet is open, it's free, and that's great. And nine times out of 10, it is great. And I think we all applaud that, but I think we all also agree to, a, to, to an extent that things do need to be kept in check as well. And it's just, 
I, I'm just throwing that out there and saying that we need more of a discussion about that and, and how best to deal with that and how best to, to handle that. The newspapers, for example, uh, before they can publish something, there's someone there that uh, censor it, or a proof of something to be published. Unlike the, like the Twitter, the Facebook, I can easily publish something, I can easily send something about you just within a second. Don't you think the, this, this distance should be controlled? And uh, even before anything goes out, because uh, primarily this, uh, th this Twitter, f uh, Facebook, uh, principally made for just friendships, interactions. Don't you think there should be a demarcation between what they should do and what they shouldn't do? And uh, if there's something like that, who really should be the policeman of this side, this agency? I don't know who should be the policeman. Um, and the uh, United that's, that's Nations? Perhaps. Oh. Perhaps. I mean, the, uh, the, that, 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 that's what we're discussing. What I'm saying is that I don't think anyone's discussed this. And when it has been brought up, the usual battle cry is, it's freedom. It should be allowed. There should be no you know, attempt to sanction it or whatever. And I, I, I'm not even sure there should be sanctions. What I'm saying is there needs to be a debate. Um, and as I say, that debate is going on in the UK at the moment. Um, and the suggestion that there will be some kind of uh, regulation on a government level is not being discussed. And I think that's good. I think it's, I think it's time that Silicon Valley actually sat down and thought about um, its increasing power, um, its increasing reach. And as I say, with the fact that more people, more and more people, are getting their news, getting their opinions, forming, forming them, uh, their ideas from social media, uh, and newspapers, television and radio are being pushed to the background, with that increased res um, uh, influence, comes a certain amount of responsibility. And I think that's the debate that um, Silicon Valley needs to be, needs to be having. Good. Um, um, I have a question. Uh, well, physical and digital world is two different spheres. Uh, we do not have a law which uh, reg regulate the uh, digital world at the moment. While the whole world is protesting uh, against ACTA agreement. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, do you think that this kind of a control of internet does not break law too? Because when we are talking about ACTA, the ACTA is breaking a, a, a law of human rights in a, a lot of uh, uh, points. And um, also, when we're talking about freedom of expression, uh, of course there is um, also um, have to accept uh, positive and negative things. But in my opinion, uh, I think that uh, internet should be free. And uh, actually this week was protest, big protest in Berlin. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask you uh, what uh, uh, your country thinks about ACTA agreement. Um, first of all, uh, I, th I think I, when I was um, talking about anyone who'd broken the law, uh, and you said you downloaded things, and you said you didn't, uh, if, if someone filmed you doing that, I could see you saying that, you know, this wouldn't be, this w this w this wouldn't be good. Um, would you support something that made it difficult for the video of you downloading things illegally? to be put out on the, uh, on, on the internet? Would, would you personally support that, bearing in mind that it's something that you would not like to happen, or not? By my point of view, I think it's uh, um From my point of view, and this is actually my masterwork, um, 
uh, I'm writing a master work about intellectual mm. property in digital world mm. and international law mm. and piracy. Mm. And uh, well, I think that um, when we we're talking about, let's say, YouTube, mm. I think that YouTube should have a, a more um, administrators around the world and offices around the world who controlled what you uh, upload in the YouTube. Uh, first of all, um, that should be some kind of um, selection uh, before, uh, before this is published. So um, this could be the way of avoiding uh, negative things. But I still think that, let's say, um, I have uh, uh, seen the case in um, Rwanda, a uh, case in uh, Sudan, actually without uh, people who are filming the, the, the genocide, the, 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 the Sudan government would put everything under the carpet. Sure. So um, sure. we have positive and negative things. And when we talk about um, uh, people cheating around uh, the world, um, their, their wives, husbands and stuff, I think that uh, uh, people in that kind of age should be responsible enough to break their relationship if they are not happy in it. Um, so, um, and also if they are, they are so famous, they, they should think about uh, how uh, uh, the people who uh, are watching them, uh, they are really actually role models. So I think that uh, such irresponsibility, uh, they, they should be anyway kicked out of their jobs because this is not a good role model. Uh, for the children okay. and us. Okay, if I, if <laughs> point, if I, point eight. Do, yeah. you, do you really? I, I, I would I just quickly on, respond to that. You, yep. You've highlighted exactly the point that I'm trying to make. You see, we sit here and we can talk in the abstract about the internet being free. It should be free. But what the first thing you said was, I think YouTube should have administrators who, who s filter and sift the stuff that's uploaded. That's not f allowing freedom. You see, in general terms, you and I and all of us here can say it's great that the internet is free, but when it comes down to the passive rights of Godwin, our own individual rights, we're not happy. And that's the debate that, that, that I want open here. You want filters, and yet you say the internet should be free. That's the dilemma. That's right. I, and my point is, there are no filters at the moment, so let's discuss whether those filters should be there. And you actually agree with that. Okay. One more question from Dave, because oh. we've been trying to get in. Uh, I've got Donnell at the back. Oh. Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, I'd also like to help with us filming this quite saliently. Um, if you could stand up briefly and introduce who you are uh, and where you're from, just to help us with the, the filming of it. Okay. Answer, we'll I'll, I'll go super quick. My name is Josh Wolf. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area where these companies are. And in the United States, we don't have a lot of prior restraints in our media. It's quite uncommon. Mm -hmm. And in thinking about how YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, etc., would work with this, once you send something out, it's pretty much like Pandora's box. It'll bounce like around, and even if you take that video down off YouTube, mm -hmm. it'll still resurface. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how would it be at all possible to mitigate this flow of information without charging excessive fees for the people mm. posting to YouTube to filter this material. Exactly. I, <laughs> I've done, I don't know. But are they having the, I mean, you, you're from that area, and I know the area fairly well. I mean, are they having this discussion there? I mean, are they talking about this at all? Or is it just, no, the internet is free. It should be free, <laughs> you know? I mean, it, is, is this debate going on? That, that's basically what I want to want to know because that debate is starting in the United Kingdom but all those great companies are in America and are they discussing this? I don't know. I, I don't think they are very much and I think a big part of it is because of prior restraints and having to get permission to mm. publish things or the government being allowed to stop people from publishing things mm. doesn't exist. So this concept right. of, of creating that barrier that the media has in other countries we've never thought of including because our media has been free to publish at least as far as their own internal dynamics decide what should be published. Right. I think we've got to have a historical insight into this. I mean, since the days of Gutenberg, you know, we've had this question. This is not a, a new question. Absolutely. There are a couple of points in history. For instance, the uh, Dreyfus affair. Uh, Emil Zola 
wrote a, a very brilliant letter, an appeal, I accuse. And um, he was thrown in jail because of it. The essence of that case had to do with espionage. Dreyfus was in innocent, but he was threatened. Uh, he was actually sent to uh, Devil's Island. Another very important case was the Pentagon Papers. I hate to think what the world would look like had we not had the privilege to access that material. One has to weigh the importance of information to the public against the considerations of the government itself. Now, more often than not, people talk about national security. They cloud or mask their interest in protestations about people's rights when in fact they're taking their rights away or infringing upon their rights. I think the body of ev evidence indicates that. I'd just like you to respond to that. No, no, ab ab absolutely right. And you know, I mean, I, I cited, cited the case uh, in my talk of uh, you know, Assad and Mubarak and, 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 and you know, th these, these, these people and places, and, and you mentioned um, other examples as well, where, you know, that, that, that shame within their borders has to be published. It has to be made public. There's no question about that. Um, you know, there, the distinction, the, 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 the lines aren't as blurred as they are in a democracy where you already have a free press. It's clear that if something is despicable is going on that has to be made public and the internet Facebook Twitter whatever have been prime examples of being able to get that message out and we saw that to a degree in in, in the Arab Spring um, the question is much more complicated in societies where you do have a free press and where it's not necessarily issues of life and death that are being talked about and that's where we need the discussion that's where we need need the debate one last short question. Yeah, very short. There we go, uh, Guardian. Um, going back to your original question, uh, Peter, about journalism, is Julian Assange a journalist or is he actually just a vanity publisher? I ask that partly because when he, uh, when The Guardian, for example, which was one of the original with the Spiegel and New York Times recipients of all the weekly uh, started reporting fairly accurately, pretty accurately, honestly, about the court case in, in, in Sweden. Yeah. He um, took all the um, CD-ROMs and everything away and gave them to the Daily Telegraph instead. So what kind of journalist is he? Is he a journalist at all? It's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a very good question, a very pertinent one, given the fact that I think WikiLeaks released um, uh, some more stuff yesterday, I think it was. I can't remember the, exactly the name of the the uh, the, the company that uh, they got the discs from. Um, but what's interesting about Assange and the Guardian, for instance, going back to the cameraman's point at the back there, is that the Guardian was scrupulous in going through the cables that uh, Assange gave them, uh, the, the 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 CD-ROM and the access that that uh, that he w that uh, Assange gave them. They were scrupulous in going through and redacting people's names, taking stuff out that could be dangerous to an individual, that could put someone's life in danger. They blocked it out. And they reported good stories of governments trying to cover things up, of governments um, carrying out abuses, whatever. But they took out the names of people who could be identified and whose lives could be put in danger. Assange decided at a later date that for some reason that wasn't good enough. That everything should be out there completely unredacted, completely uncensored. My question is, should he have been allowed to do that? You're shaking your, you're shaking your head. You just said the internet should be free. I mean, well, ex exactly, and that's, and that, exactly, it's weighing uh, everything up. And at the moment, at the moment, some people would argue, and perhaps I would argue, that it's way too far the other way. And that balance is not to be struck. And going back to your question, David, I, I think he, I totally think he's a self-publicist. I mean, I'm one of the founding members of the, of the um, uh, Frontline Club. And frankly, I am a little bit angry at the support that the Frontline Club 
has given Julian Assange. Um, but that's just a personal opinion, nothing to do with anything else. Um, I think he's a charlatan. That's my personal opinion. Okay. Clive, thank you very much. Yeah. Great start to the day. <laughs> I mean, they're very young freedoms. We, the, we all act as though it's always been thus, but really it's only been thus for 20, the last... 20, 30 years. I, 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 didn't, I didn't use the internet until about 1997, 98. Yeah, there we go. Uh, uh, huge freedoms, huge risks, perhaps. You suggested a huge mm -hmm. price to pay. Nine times out of ten people on the net get it right. That means one time out of ten they don't. That was and that the, could... That was the, the yeah. stat that you're working with mm -hmm. intuitively. Yeah, so it's a little bit problematic. Who regulates it? Uh, the idea of the United Nations was thrown up and none other. Yeah, it'd be an interesting question. Uh, I noticed that one or two people were wanting to ask further questions there, but we do have to move on to the next point, and I'm sure because a lot of these core issues we're just going to be sort of circling around them in the next couple of days. So I don't think anybody needs to worry too much about you know various points being addressed. Yeah. So once again, thank you very much. Yeah. No problem. Thank you.